I'm Ryan Tedder. I'm a songwriter, producer, TV personality, and the lead singer of One Republic. And right now, you're watching Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Reminiscing about the good old days and all that. You know, tracking my roots, where I came from, and where I'm going. But like I say, man. Hey, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Today I'm here with the amazingly talented Ryan Tedder. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I usually ask my guests, how'd you get this job? Uh, I got this job because I would have failed at any other job. I would have, I realized by the time I got to college, I had a, a completely realistic residing fear that I would get fired from any normal job. So I figured I had to create my own path and 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 I, I would have rather been broke and happy than than paid and working for somebody really yeah. uh, let's go back in the chronology as far as back yeah. you want to take it <clears throat> what did you want to be when you grew up uh, the, the first memory that I have of anything that I wanted to do was acting um, I was obsessed with theater I still am uh, it's funny I had my parents visiting this weekend and we talked just about like childhood and life and I'm doing like four or five things right now in different and all in different uh, industries. And they said, my stepdad said, you know, none of this surprises me. Our biggest concern when you were a kid was not would you succeed at something, but how would you pick? Mm -hmm. And and since I was a kid, I I've said so many times, I wish you like I wish reincarnation exists. I hope it ex exists because I actually do want to do multiple things. Uh, I wanted to, at one point, wanted to be a jet fighter pilot. I wanted to work for the CIA. I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be a chef. Um, but acting ultimately led me to musical theater, which led me, obviously, to music. Uh, my dad was a songwriter, a gospel songwriter, way back in the day. I started playing piano at age, at, at age three. Um, started writing creative poetry and things like that in early high school. And I had a teacher pull me aside and say, it's funny, my theater teacher pulled me aside and said, if you want to do this professionally, I think you can, and I'll get you a scholarship for acting by the time you graduate if you stick with this. And wow. she did. Amazing. And then my, my creative writing teacher, my uh, English teacher, pulled me aside and said, I think you have a future as a writer. If you are interested in pursuing this, I, I think you really should. And so when all those worlds collided by the time I graduated, I ended up going to college, and I, the, the first summer after my freshman year, I kind of threw my future into the hands of God, fate, you know, I, I said, all right, I'm going to apply for like six or seven film studios for an internship and I'm going to mm -hmm. apply to six or seven record labels and, and music companies. So at the time you were in Colorado? This time I was in Colorado, yes. Yeah. And I, I, I'd done music all through high school. I was started writing songs when I was 15 and, um, and meanwhile, I was acting. I was uh, going, doing commercials. I was auditioning remotely whenever I could. I, I was born in Oklahoma. I was an only child. And I think there's something about not having the, I, I wish I had brothers and sisters that I'd grown up with. There's something about ha not having that distraction, especially pre-YouTube era, pre-internet era, that, right. that forces you to focus on something. I'd get home by myself and, and think, well, I, you know, there's nothing really good on TV. Yeah. Uh, there's a piano. I have a drum set, and and I would just I would do that. I'd play piano. I'd write songs. I'd listen to music. I'd I would uh, memorize monologues and recite them in the mirror in the bathroom and try to, you know, try to you know brush up my acting chops. And ultimately, I I kind of thought I I want to do acting so bad. I want to be a songwriter, a recording artist, a musician so bad. I can't pick. But I know that if I try to do them both at the same time, they might cannibalize each other. Mm -hmm. And I might just be mediocre at both. I want to be great at something. And so I applied to film studios and I applied to record labels for internships. And I did this weird kind of like fickle hand of fate, uh, roll the dice thing where I thought whichever one, whichever industry offers me the job, that's the one I'm, that's the one I'm going in on. So if I get a, a gig with Paramount Pictures or Sony Pictures, I'm going into film. I will be an actor, I'll be a producer, something. If I get a, 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 a scenario with a record label, 
or a publisher, I will go into music. Just so happens I landed an internship. I, I mean, I called everybody and I ended up with an internship for DreamWorks. And initially when they called me back, I thought, oh my God, Steven Spielberg, SKG, DreamWorks, pictures, this is gonna be incredible. Yeah. Um, turns out it was DreamWorks music. And then I thought, oh, DreamWorks record label, that's amazing. They have Rufus Wainwright and, and you know, uh, a bunch of other artists that I liked at the time, Eels and... About what year was this? 2000. Okay. Something like that. And um, turns out it was DreamWorks Publishing. I didn't know what a publishing company was. And I found out that a publishing company is a songwriting company. It's the songwriting division of a, of a music company. Mm -hmm. And they sign songwriters and they catalog songs and they that's how they make their money. They own 25% of copyrights. And and then I then I thought, all right, well, I'm going to go to LA, work for a uh, DreamWorks Publishing that okay, it's not what I thought, but I'll do that. You're in the vicinity. I'm thinking, right? Yeah, in the vicinity cuz LA was my was my dreamland since I was 10 years old. Since the first time I came to LA for spring break, I knew these, these were my people, this was my place, like I was meant to be in California and I spent the rest of my life trying to get back here. And turns out that DreamWorks Publishing has an office in Nashville. That's where I ended up. And I ended up being an intern and, and cataloging songs and booking recording sessions. And I thought, well, this is where I'm supposed to be. So what can I do here that is, like what's the thing to do here? Well, songwriting. Fortunately, I was already writing songs and I started taking every session that I could. I started uh, producing demos for country writers that were trying to write pop songs. I would produce these pop demos for three, 400 bucks, mm -hmm. make a little money. And that summer I auditioned, uh, NSYNC was huge at the time. And it was the very end of their like, you know, NSYNCness. And right. they uh, were, came, came through town on a stadium tour and they were holding auditions for a, a record deal like trying to find local talent. They were doing a TV show on MTV in uh, like affiliated with TRL, which was at the time, as you probably remember, the biggest thing in the universe. Yep. And so they came through town. I auditioned with my original song. And after the audition, the local paper pulled me over and did an interview uh, with me, which was my first interview. <laughs> and the producer who formed NSYNC happened to be at that audition. And she said, hey, I, I think you're gonna win this. Wow. And uh, about four weeks later, I, they flew me to New York on TRL. I performed a song and I won a record deal on TRL. Did you just sing? Did you play guitar, I piano? I sang and played guitar. Okay. Brian McKnight was a judge. Pink was a judge. Cool. The, one of the NSYNC guys, Lance Bass, was a judge. Yeah. Um, and later became this big producer guy. <clears throat> yeah. 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 And and uh, I think that was the first TV show that Lance produced, actually, because now he does TV shows and stuff. And um, so I, that was my first kind of taste of fame. And I went from living in a dorm room in Tulsa, Oklahoma, attending college back where I was born. And um, I went from the dorm room to that, I mean, within 24 hours, I'm like staying at the Trump Hotel. That night I get into it, uh, Lance is like, you should come out with us, we're, we're gonna hit the club tonight. I was like, I've never been to a club, that sounds amazing. <laughs> I don't think I was even old enough to be in a club at that point. I get in the limousine and it was, I'll never forget this, it was Justin Timberlake, uh, whoever he was dating at the time, uh, Derek Jeter, Miss Universe, Lance Bass, <laughs> and then like a couple guys, uh, Aton and Nelson, who became my friends and now like my business partners for a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. Wow. So it was a, it was a very um, serendipitous weekend in New York and that changed and Timbaland happened to watch that show and about a year later, Timbaland, who was at, he had just done Justin Timberlake's al solo album, Nelly Furtado, yeah, Missy Elliott. Popping. Biggest producer writer in the world and he, call, he cold calls me a year later while I was uh, in Nashville and said, I'd like to fly you out to Miami and I'd like to sign you to a production deal and develop you as an artist and producer. And, and that started me on the career towards music. At that point, uh, I sadly said goodbye to acting and, <laughs> um, and went full tilt into music. Wow. Yeah, I, I just mean, gave you the whole chronology. Well, talk about a big break though. I yeah. mean, that thing, I mean, that was everything. That was everything. Yeah, that was, that was, you know, you have those defining moments in, in your life. And um, yeah. for people, you know, for me, a big part of it was I had teachers. I had a, my theater teacher, uh, Mrs. Jordan, that when I was 14, 
you know, waited till class was over. And it was day one, class one theater. Couldn't have been more excited to be in that class. And she pulled, and after class, she pulled, said, Ryan, can you stay after? I thought I was in trouble. And she pulled me aside and we did, we did a whole, uh, day one was improv. So it was like, how can you, can you maintain character, make people laugh, make people like, you know, scream, whatever. And, um, she kept me after class and, and said, Hey, that's when she told me, Hey, I think you, you have a, a natural gift for this. I, I, I've been doing this for forever and I can spot them like that. I will get you a full ride scholarship for acting. If you, if you stay with me, wow. that was a defining moment. Four years later, I had a, a, a youth group leader who had been a touring drummer for Mariah Carey and, um, funny enough was like one of the original members of butthole surfers, which is hysterical. And, um, and I was performing, I was playing music at a, with our choir in Colorado at this point, same deal. He pulled me aside afterwards and said, Hey, I've, I've done this a long time. And, and like, if you want to do music full time, like professionally, you, you've got that extra thing that like you need to have to, to actually make it happen. Mm -hmm. I had two or three of those, uh, turning point moments that, um, are the, th I mean, I hung my hopes on those small interactions that just gave you that I'm supposed to do this. I can do this. And, yeah. and I think those are the, the things that led me to where I was. If I hadn't, I don't know, honestly, if I would have gone after, if I hadn't had, cause I had a lot of naysayers for sure. When you're growing up in, you know, the country outside of Oklahoma city or, or in Tulsa and, and you have a stepdad who's a banker, your mom's a school teacher. There's nothing around you that's really indicating, hey, you should you should move to LA and you should go into entertainment. Well, and it's probably almost like, yeah, sure, okay, great. That's exactly what I got. Yeah. I didn't tell anybody. Like my stepsisters, who I'm very close with, when I was on MTV, I hadn't told anybody. Nobody <laughs> in my college knew I had flown to New York. Nobody knew I was gonna be on TV. My family didn't know, nobody knew. So good. Because my thought was, I don't wanna be the guy and I've lived my whole life with this philosophy. I, I never want to be the guy that talks about stuff that just like, just like sits around and, and like just kind of, you know, uh, waxes philosophical on what might be or what you might do or what you could do. And I, I couldn't stand that. Like the boy who cried wolf stuff. Like you're talking yeah. about, I'm, I'm going to do this. You know, it'd be really cool. I'm thinking about trying this, doing that. Yeah. People who talk all the day, about, all day long about really good ideas that, you know, you know, things that they want to do with their life. And then they immediately come up with 30 reasons why not to. A great subtle lesson I just want to underscore for people who are listening and watching. Ideas are one thing. You can have great yeah. ideas, but execution is everything. It's everything, man. Yeah. The amount of <laughs> music, uh, music video is a good uh, metaphor for that. You get pitch when you're a recording artist, you do music videos, right? They're very expensive. They're time consuming. There's a lot of people, a lot of production. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, without fail, nine times out of 10, the, the, the gap between the, what's called the video treatment, the treatment that you are pitched by a director on paper, phenomenal. Yeah. Oh my God, this can be the best video we've ever done. Yeah. Like, I can't wait. This is insane. 90% of the time you get the final product and you, you're watching it and you go, this is nothing yeah. like what happened treatment. what happened and it's all execution yeah a hundred percent execution and i think the reason that i've undertaken so many different things and i've always been i mean the blessing and the curse at least of being my, me and i live with it is um i don't I, I i don't like there's not some i'm not this person that's like i need to climb mount everest i need to run a marathon I need to prove to myself that, that I can um, accomplish some outstanding human feat. And because the, especially when you get into your 30s and 40s, it's like we all get overtaken by something that, you know, uh, some type of internal um, crisis where you need to prove that you're still healthy and you're still with it and you can still do stuff. And I've never had that. I just love the process. Uh, for me, I've, I, I you know, I, I'm executive producing a film this year uh, with Margot Robbie and Brian Unclis um, called El Beso. It's a Mexican musical set, set place, not a Mexican musical, it's a Latin musical set, set place in, in Mexico. Um, I don't really know that much about producing films, but I always knew that I wanted to and I, and I had enough people tell me 
the way you think or the way your mind works actually would work really well for, for film if you ever wanted to do that. And I said, well, when the right opportunity comes along and I know that I can, I can actually deliver, uh, I'll, then I'll jump in. And, this, and the only way I know how to do anything, it's like if I think I want to do something, if I think I want to do it, you jump in. Like that, that, that's it. You jump in and you either get right out because the water's too cold yeah. or, or you, 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 you find your, your footing and, and you acclimate and then all of a sudden you're treading and then you're swimming and then you're, you're, you're racing. And, and I don't understand any other way to do it. I remember in, in college, um, this will give you an example, like I, I, would, I would do multiple sports and, and then I was working two or three jobs at the same time. I had this definitely FOMO. Right, I think anybody that's like me operates for a, a certain amount of FOMO. Like I'll have days where I'm sitting around in LA thinking about Paris, <laughs> and all of a sudden I'm getting jealous of everybody that's in Paris. I'm like, what am I missing right now in Paris? I should, we should, we should go to Paris. <laughs> we should go to Tokyo. You know, and I, I, I have to shut all of that down because it really is this like app that doesn't turn off in the back of my head. Um, but when I was in college, like I was the guy that on a Thursday night before spring break would just decide, I wanna to go, to, to go to New York for spring break. Well, spring break starts tomorrow, and, or I wanna to, to drive to Chicago. And then I would, I would have the idea, think about it during class that day, and then get back to the, the dorm room and walk up and down the hall and say, hey, I'm going to Chicago tomorrow, who wants to go? And I would look for a show of hands and then mm -hmm. sp go spend a week in Chicago, crash on couches, you know, just figure it out. And I think that there are, two kinds of people in life, people that like to get thrown into situations or throw themselves into situations and just figure it out. And that is the process, that's the fun. Can I figure this out? This is so different than anything I know. I haven't been taught how to do this. I wonder if I can figure it out. And then there's the people where that terrifies them. Yeah, I mean, it seems like that serves you really well with everything that you're doing, whether that's the singer, songwriter, gig, whether it's the executive producing, your new entrepreneurial venture into yeah. beverages. <laughs> it's this fail yeah. fast mentality, right? Yeah. And then, you know, uh, I hate to use the buzzy word pivot, but maybe you're pivoting yeah. or yeah. iterating or, you know, you get in there and figure it out. Yeah, um, more or less. That's the, like, I, I have a lot of friends that I went to high school and college with that revel in knowing where they will be next week, next Wednesday, a year from Wednesday, and so on and so forth, and and that that safety and that comfort of uh, that's I know my neighbors. These are my neighbors. They're I, they're not leaving. They're, that consistency. There are people that that, that thrive in that, yeah. and I and I don't besmirch that at all, and I don't look down on that. Um, I just could not be more polar opposite. So do you think that's what gets people stuck? Um, this fear of failure or. Yeah. Analysis paralysis, they don't take action. Analysis, uh, paralysis by analysis, oh my God. I have friends, I'm related to some people. Paralysis by analysis is a life stealer, a dream killer, um, overthinking, fear. Two, two people, as far as I've understood in my lifetime. Yeah. Well, you know, let's be clear. So caution in some professions is really good. Of course. We're really glad yeah. that the airplane pilot you know, she doesn't say like, you know, I'm gonna take a chance today. I'm gonna go for this. <laughs> Let's go up to 60,000 feet. Let's just go for it. Cabin pressure, eh. Or your surgeon, right? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, in some occupations, yeah. that works really well. Yeah. Now, there are also surgeons that do big boulder, uh, big rock climbing and take their lives into their own hands in ways that I would never imagine and are far bigger risk takers than I am. I think a surgeon, first of all, my, my sister-in-law is a surgeon, the idea of cutting on another human being is so much riskier than anything I would ever attempt in life from my perspective. Yeah. Um, but I, I understand the point you're making. I think that people, as best as I can tell, are governed by two fundamental drivers, um, fear and legacy. And those two things, and when I say legacy, uh, pursuing money is the fear of being broke to some extent, uh, right? And we all have that residing in us. I was broke. I didn't come from money. Um, I had periods in my childhood where we were well below poverty and, and getting evicted, and then went into the middle class world for a while, and then after I graduated, was back to <laughs> broke and getting evicted. Um, that's always in the back of my mind, but it's not a, it's not something at this point, 
I'm not, I definitely don't do things for money. I do things to preserve and protect the money I've made. I do a lot of commercial real estate, buy big old boring office buildings and, and Walgreens and, and stuff like that. That's more just like long-term, you know, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be smart. Uh, legacy and fear, I think, govern people a, a tremendous amount. Legacy, what can I do? Whether that is even wealth building. The, what am I doing with commercial real estate other than building a legacy for my descendants? Am I worried that they're gonna be broke? No, not necessarily. So wh why are you doing it? Well, and then if you have to really get deep on that in meta, you go, why, why am I doing that? I don't know. That's what people do, I guess. Uh, fear. Well, it seems like you're diversifying your portfolio. I'm diversifying my portfolio. Exactly. My right? business manager would be happy. You don't have all your eggs in that one no, basket. No, I, I definitely, you know, I just, I was about to put it all in Bitcoin and then I thought, pause, hold that thought. Wait a minute. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Um, can, I, yeah. I just, can I just point out what I see in yeah. you, though, is a common thread? Collaboration. Yes. A hundred percent. I mean, if it's commercial real estate, it seems like, I don't think that you're doing that alone. Oh, no. You get hammered. Uh, you know, singer-songwriter. Yeah. Um, you're the front man. Yeah. But uh, I would assume that that's pretty collaborative as well. It's very collaborative. Uh, writing songs. Let's just maybe do a short list for people for who sure. don't know your resume of some of these songs that you've written for other people. Yeah. Uh, Adele. Adele. Yeah. Beyonce. Yeah. Taylor Swift. Yeah. Who else? McCartney. Yeah. Uh, Jonas Brothers, Sucker, more recently. Yeah. Uh, Thomas Rhett. Yeah. Uh, nothing a beer can't fix, more recently. <laughs> One Republic. Yeah. A lot, I, at this point, a very, I've been fortunate enough to work with pretty much every artist that I like. And it is about collaboration. You hit the nail on the head. It, I will not. Somebody asked me in an interview recently, how do you maintain all these pots, these spinning plates? First of all, I actually thrive in that. I waited tables for years. I love it. I would still wait tables. I love waiting. Ta I love waiting tables. If anybody's hiring, mm -hmm. um, I was the guy that like, you have a three table limit per section mm -hmm. or four. If they thought you could handle it, I would. I would see. Can I do six? I would take. If somebody's in the weeds, for I'd be like, limits. give me your table. I got it. Yeah. I wanted to see what is my bandwidth capacity. Yeah. Um, it is all about collaboration, though. I will not do that. There's one common thread in every single thing that I do. I will not jump into anything that I don't have full mastery of already by myself, which means there's really nothing else that I'm going to jump into uh, at this stage of my life. If I do not have a strategic partner that, and this is the key thing, knows more about what we're doing than I do. Yeah. Whether it's buying a building, my partners are way smarter than me and way more, 50 years more experience in commercial yeah. real estate. Doing a, producing a film, uh, Margot Robbie speaks for herself. Her husband, Tom, speaks for himself. Brian Unkless is the, the, the fourth of, our, of the four amigos. He did I, Tanya, Bright. Uh, he did the new Harley Quinn movie, and he did uh, Hunger Games. He yeah. knows what he's doing. Yeah, you don't need to be the driver. You can yeah. ride shotgun. Let me be, uh, let an arm be an arm, let a leg be a leg, yeah. in, in all cases. And, and for me, that allows me also to lean into what I'm good at. And a, a, a friend of mine, Recently, when he refers to songwriters and people, he always says, well, their superpower is, is lyrics. Their superpower is, is melody. Their super and I think that's an interesting term, but like, let everybody flex on their superpower and you just flex on yours. So I know what I'm gonna bring to the table. And then if we, if we each are firing on all cylinders and we're not overextended, then in theory, that's gonna lead us to the, the best outcome of whatever the project is. If it's a beverage, yeah. if I wouldn't have done this if I didn't have the partners that I have, uh, if it's songwriting, if it's an album, all of it. Well, it's this mentality that great ideas can come from anywhere. Yes. I think I was reading a story when, you know, uh, I can't remember if you were writing it for Ed Sheeran or someone mm -hmm. else, and then Ed wrote, I think you were in London with Ed, and Ed ended up writing yeah. the song that ended up being the song. Yes, that's correct. And, yeah. you know, he thought your song was there and then he wrote a little bit better one. You're like, yeah. dude, that's it. That's, that's that, Yeah, I wrote a song with Ed called Happier on Divide, on his last album. And then uh, it was it was the first single for a while. It was it's a, this big mid-tempo emotional, like, huge, huge song. And it's, But it's the kind of song where if it doesn't come first, it, it's, it's, it may not come or it's going to come last, right? And a lot of times that's the way albums work. And then I happened to be crashing at his place in London, um, staying the night, and we were promoting Warner Public stuff. I was there for a day. 
come through. He comes through, we stayed up till three in the morning drinking whiskey, and he plays me a song that he wrote that day called Shape of You. And I was like, little song. <laughs> I was like, um, yeah, so he's like, what do you think? I was like, I think that our song, Happier, will not be the first single. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. And you just, he was writing for another artist when he yeah. wrote it. So many great lessons are just, I want to underscore. I want to go back to um, your entrepreneurial spirit. Um, the lesson I think that I see is something that my, my mentor, Seth Godin, taught me. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, sometimes the riskiest thing you can do is play it safe. A hundred percent. But on the outside looking in, a lot of these people who are risk averse, you know, the people who like to know what's going to happen next, they yeah. want a script, they want bullet points, whatever. Yeah. Um, those people think that we're risk takers. Yeah. And that's really not the case. No. We are risk mitigators. A hundred percent. Right? hundred percent. So you even said it, you're like, I, I want to know that I'm button up. I want to make sure that I'm qualified. Yeah. Um, and I don't jump in and bite off more than I can chew. No. That's why we collaborate. Yes. Uh, and that's a super smart lesson. Yeah. Uh, cause you don't have to be the number one or even, you know, so we'll get, you can go in with others. No. no. Cause you know, the strength in numbers and all that. A hundred percent. Um, look, the, the, um, I mean, uh, what's the movie that just won the, the Oscar for, um, I'm spacing it, Parasite. Parasite, yeah. Okay. When they, when they, uh, announced, you know, um, you know, best film, Parasite, 30 people were on stage. Yeah. 30 people were on stage. And they're in South Korea based film production company. And I can tell you, having been to Seoul and played South Korea, that to, to tell a conservative South Korean housewife slash mom, mom, I'm going into film, it's, you might as well say, like, I'm joining the circus. It's the scariest thing in the world. And yet, I look, that's the first thought I had is because having been to Korea, um, Seoul's a little less conservative, but there's a lot of conservatism there. And, and I thought of all the parents of all the people on stage who are sitting here going, <gasps> like, they're watching television in South Korea going, I can't believe it. You My daughter it. said, I, I told her not to do it. Yeah. I told her not to go into film. And look, she's standing there with an Oscar. Yeah. And there's strength in numbers. And, and I am 100%, I think I use the term risk mitigation 50 times a week when I look at everything. I'm, I'm looking at everything that I'm into and going, how can we idiot proof this? How do we idiot proof this? Uh, because what I don't like is to fail. Nobody likes to fail. And yeah. you learn from failure though, and you have to be willing to fail. I know that between the TV show I'm doing over here, I'm doing two TV shows that I am executive producer of, a film, new album with One Republic, singles with Jonas Brothers and, and, and Diplo and other people, not all of them are gonna succeed, without question. Uh, I want all of them to be hits. I, I've, I've, I've covered them in, in bubble wrap, creative bubble wrap with smart people who know how to execute, the best directors, the best producers, the best writers, but even still, I know that the probability states that not all of them will succeed on the level I want them to, yeah. but that's part of me also doing five different things. Well, and I was going to jump in to say, we also have to remind ourselves time and place, right? Yep. You know, back to the airplane metaphor, we're really glad that the pilot doesn't take chances. Oh, yeah. Um, but in, in songwriting, you can take <clears throat> chances. It's all about risk benefit, uh, yes. risk reward, Yeah. right? So yep. um, in songwriting, you can afford to, you know, write a melody, write some lyrics, maybe it doesn't go anywhere. Yep. You start over, maybe even shelf that. Yeah. And you come back to it a year later, and it's yeah. it's something else. That's okay. Yeah, that's fine. R O. I refer to a term that I use called R O T, return on time. Yeah. And R O I is obviously a phrase that we all know, and you know all too well with um, the you know stack of interviews you've done over the years. But R O T to me is the thing that matters at this point. Um, I love a lot of things. That's always been my curse. I, I used to get so stressed out in high school knowing that I was like countdown to 18, countdown to figuring out what I'm gonna do. And I was tortured because there were so many things I wanted to do. And I was, yeah. I could be equally as exuberant and I could sales pitch you on five different career paths yeah. with equal level of exuberance and, and, and complete uh, lack of hyperbole, being 100% authentic to my interest in those things. Um, I, now that I'm in a place where, you know, I, I Early on, I read a quote, and I can't remember for the life of me who, whose quote it was. I think it was some famous old investor. And he said, uh, 
Money isn't the point, and it's not. Money is the byproduct of understanding your reality, your reality, and executing on it to the best of your abilities, whatever that is. So if you understand the degree to which you can understand your own reality and your natural gift set and your bandwidth and all those things and however you're able to lean into that and maximize it, money finds you. So I don't, outside of investing, everybody wants to make back the money that they've, that they've earned, right? Um, and with interest. Outside of investing, when I look at everything else, whether it's film, TV, all those things, yes, I want a good deal. I want to be fairly compensated. Um, but I look at my return on time. I have a family, I have two kids. I've traveled for the better part of 12 years because of One Republic. I've, on a touring year, we'll do 400,000 uh, flight miles in a year. Um, we tour this summer with Macklemore and, and in the fall, and I'm limiting the amount of touring that I do at this point, but we're still doing a healthy amount. I want to squeeze every drop out of, of every day, and my return on time has to be maximized. So if I look at three or four different things and I have to pick one, I will look at ROT. Which one, if I enjoy all four of them equally, then it becomes more of a financial and family decision. Mm -hmm. Which one of these, given the same amount of time, if all things are equal and my enjoyment is equal, which one of these gives me the, has the highest likelihood of compensation, of greatest compensation, and will allow for the most amount of time that I can spend with my family and be a normal uh, human. Yeah, the joy equation. The joy equation. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's a moving target at all times. And in, in the entertainment field and other fields, you can't anticipate. You can't always with 100% accuracy predict. Some things that actually have garbage return end up becoming uh, time bandits and suck way too much of your time away. Mm -hmm. And it's the older you get, it's identifying the people that you know are time bandits, because we all know those people and the, the scenarios, and you can only learn those things from experience where you go, I've seen this play out before, I've read this book, this doesn't end well. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, go, I'm not gonna open that, the first, the first chapter. Isn't that incredible? It's so intuitive. Like, the only way to get wise, yeah. right, is through experience. That's it. And the only way to get experience is through making mistakes. Yeah. And so it's this, wash, rinse, repeat process where you're going in, mitigating risk, yeah. making mistakes, learning, iterating, pivoting, whatever you want to, adjusting, yeah. and then becoming a little smarter the next time so you don't hopefully repeat the same mistake. Yeah. And eventually, and some people, you know, uh, they get lucky out of the gate, you know, at a young age. I know those people. <laughs> and I'm, and I, I used to get really upset by that when I was younger, yeah. and now I just go, they have no idea how lucky they just got. Yeah. And that, and, and that, I don't care that they're 25, I'm old enough now to go, that probably won't happen again for them. Like on that level, on that level. They don't know yet that they just struck gold because they, they don't have enough perspective to understand the magnitude of what they just stumbled into. Well, and the other reality is that life has many facets. Yeah. So if later on in their life they decide to start a family, you know, under the same principles 100%. or process, or execution, they may not have the same result. No, and there's always a uh, there's always a trade-off, man. Like that's the other thing. I, I know other people like me that that feel that wish that there were um, 30 hours in a day. I mean, I would I would love that. I get I get sad when I see the sun going down. Like a lot of people live for the night. I'm the opposite. I, when the sun comes up in the morning, and especially in Cal Southern California, I was driving around today with the windows down with my kid in the back, uh, driving him to school, like listening to music and whatever. And I was just thinking, man, it is mid-February, and it is, I have the windows down, the birds are chirping, and- Life is good. Life is good, right? Um, I, I, I still wish that there were, at least another two or three hours in a day, every day would be amazing. I think, you know, guys, like I've known Gary Vee for a while. I mean, I mean, Lord knows that guy could use a 30 hour day. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean, he would figure out, he could fill a 48 hour day. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, that will always be there for me. There will always be that, that, but the older I get, the more calm I get about it. But the, the whole like, oh, there's so many things I want to do. There's so many places I want to see. So many restaurants I want to eat at. Um, and you realize that you, you can't do it all. You do have to make choices. That's where the ROT kicks in. Um, return on time is, is everything. And now when I look at anything I do consider, the first questions I ask, um, when I got into TV and I, I created a, a TV uh, 
series a year ago and sold it and we, we actually start shooting it here in probably about five or six weeks. Talk about it. Yeah, all right, this is a show that I, I created um, last fall. There's a couple things. I'm developing a music show with NBC right now, aside from Songland, that um, is taking the whole notion of all these reality shows and competitions and and I've been watching them for years and, and um, a lot of them make good TV and, and have a lot of fans but very few of them net um, careers and actual successful artists and so I I don't want to say devised I I, I, th I thought up a what I would want to take part in and I approach almost everything and I think other creatives I've spoken to do the same Everything I make from, from, from this beverage, literally from day one with this, to this TV show, it's a very um, I'm, a somewhat narcissistic approach. Well, it sounds like reverse engineering. It, it, it kind of is. I'm, looking at, I'm, I'm always looking at what do I want to experience? What do yeah. I want to taste? What do I want to see? Yeah. What do I wish existed when I was a kid? So much of my process is... Even when I work with artists, I'm thinking, what song do I want to hear them sing? What song do I want to hear them sing? Forget what they've already sung. I, I, there's a certain thing that I'm missing from their portfolio that I want to hear. And I created a show for, I was watching um, TV with my kids, as parents do all the time, over the last few years, and less than thrilled by the child programming. Meanwhile, I could watch a movie by Illumination, and that, excuse me, or Pixar, and love it. My kid loves it, I loved it, and the co-viewing experience, I, I go, why are these so enjoyable and then so much of the stuff that I'm seeing on kids' networks not enjoyable? Like, my kids might watch it, but I, I can barely suffer through it. The canned laughter, the four camera, you know, scripted comedies. And, and then my kid would go from watching one of these shows that are just like the lowest common denominator, whatever, and then he'd say, can we watch The Office? Can we watch <laughs> Portlandia? Can we watch, you know, and what that was telling me was, Kids are more sophisticated than you think, especially now. If I have to sit here and watch these shows, and I have a five-year-old too, so I'm gonna go through it all again. If I have to sit here and watch these shows, I want there to be a great show with great music that's actually funny, that is compelling, with compelling storyline and characters because kids deserve better. So I created a, sh a concept based on that, planted it at a music school in Southern California because that's what I wish I went to. Mm -hmm. And you have to audition to get in. I brought in uh, Simon Fuller uh, from American Idol and you know, the Spice Girls, the, 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 the TV Svengali, who's a good friend of mine. Uh, we partnered up again because this guy has 10 times more experience than me. He knows the child space. He knows the young adult space. He understands television and music and how they can work uh, combined. And I also knew that my bandwidth could not handle not having a strategic partner and to be lucky enough to get someone like Simon Fuller, like, please. Yeah. And he, he was developing a similar idea at a different network. So we, we combined forces in creating the show yeah. and, and then went through all the casting, went through all of it. And as this thing was getting greenlit, the first thing I did was, or before it got greenlit, I called up a couple friends of mine who do television and said, what's going to be expected of me? This is a show, I think it's gonna get picked up. Um, I'm an EP, I'm a creator of the show. What, what's going to be expected of my time and, and my commitments over the next five years? If this show's successful, 10 years, who knows? Yeah. And I had to talk through that and, and figure out, okay, um, I need to have a partner in this and otherwise I will, I will go gray early. I can't, I can't handle it. It sounds like that movie Fame, if it was a reality show. Yes, it's, it's like Fame. This isn't a reality show though. So this is, this is, it's cast, it's scripted. Okay. And we have our cast from the UK, uh, like Vancouver, Miami, it's all over the US. We've brought in a brilliant uh, casting group uh, to help us. And it took about four or five months to cast and get the script together. And uh, I'm ecstatic about it right now yeah. um, because it's a show that I actually want to watch. I actually read the script yesterday. Finally got the script, read it through yesterday. And it's on Nickelodeon, uh, it's gonna be, it's gonna be nuts. And and something that I wanna watch with my kids, and that's all I wanted. I just wanted to create, if I have to sit here watching these networks, I wanna watch a show that I wanna watch, that I, that I can tell other parents, this show's so so cool, you gotta watch this. Yeah. And my kids will love and be obsessed with the songs, all original music and characters. And so with, e with each one of these things, I'm approaching it from 
El Beso, the, 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 the musical with Margot Robbie. What do I want to watch? What songs do I want to hear? Uh, and, which is a very narcissistic way to do it, but I don't know how else you do anything. I completely relate with that. That's how I produced this show. That's yeah. how I started. Like, yeah. I, I'm hopefully asking the questions that my audience want to know yeah. about how to solve their problems or take away their pain or, yeah. or educate, entertain, inspire them. Yeah, well, I, th I think that, well then, yeah, you understand what I'm, you understand what I'm saying. You yeah. have to, I, I'm a massive consumer of media, of food, of life, travel, all these things. Mm -hmm. And from 12 years of touring around the world with, with One Republic, it's distilled my taste. It's distilled what I think is beautiful architecture, a beautiful hotel, a beautiful ho hotel experience or food experience or travel experience because I have been doing it professionally for so long. Yeah. And before you know it, you start to realize, wait a minute, I'm, I'm kind of a litmus test or a barometer for a lot of things that I never thought I would be. Well, that's the experience and wisdom thing. That's it. It's experience and wisdom and, and getting that eye so I was watching the Ralph Lauren documentary uh, this past week off and on. It's a long documentary. He's not a, he can't draw anything. He can't draw dresses and people and outfits and whatever. He didn't know first thing about styling women, but he, he knew what he wanted to see his wife in, mm -hmm. what he wanted to see, what made his wife beautiful and what he aesthetically thought would work on her. And the entire women's line for Ralph Lauren, which didn't initially exist, started simply as him coming up with pieces that would look good on his wife. And it's really not more complicated than that. A lot of people don't pursue things or decide to do things because they tell themselves, I don't know anything about that. God, I would, I would love to be, I would love to be a set decorator. I would love to be an interior designer. I would love to, to de design an app because there's, there's an app that's missing that would make my life easier, but I'm just too afraid to do it because I don't know how to do it. And I think that is one of the most dangerous things that you can tell yourself. I don't know how to do it. Therefore I shouldn't. Yeah. Um, what would happen? What would happen if I quit my job? I hate my job. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely hate it. I loathe it. I live for the weekends. I'm doing it, but I have a wife and two kids and I'm doing the right thing. Being miserable and then you're it, that blowing back on your wife and kids because they can see through that. That's not doing the right thing. Yeah. Uh, I, somebody told me a, a, a number of years ago, we were talking about fear, making decisions because of fear or whatever. And they were explaining to me this conversation they had with a friend of theirs, how they were trying to just like get through to this person. Like you need to leave that job, pursue that dream or you're going to, you're dying inside the light. What's that quote? The, the majority of all people lead lives of quiet desperation. And I heard that when I was a teenager and that hit me like a lightning bolt. I am not, whatever the opposite of that quote is, that's what I'm going to do mm -hmm. because the, the thought of quiet desperation is, so sad and so terrifying. And I think the opposite is going for it. Yeah, the, the opposite is, is absolutely going for it, living in the present and activating and- Believing in yourself. Yes, yeah. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? I was telling somebody the other day about like this person that needs to quit their job. And I was saying, do, do you think that you're going to die? I was like, is it, cause if death is, is the result of your decision, then I would advise you maybe don't do it. Stay, stay in your miserable job, whatever. Aside from death, Let's work backwards from death being the worst. That's a 10. Let's go back to one being success and the thing that you want to do. Somewhere in that scale between de death and not and, and thriving is where you're going to be and anything. And I was like, where would you put yourself now on that scale of one to 10? They're like, oh, probably eight. Eight, because that's how miserable I am. I was like, well, if leaving your job and, and pursuing the thing you want to do would at least get you to a seven, it's again. worth it. Yeah. So that brings us to Mad Tasty. Yeah. Uh, in a category that's huge, uh, the beverage category, I don't know how many out of the gate succeed, but I would think, I don't have the math on this, very low success yeah. rate. Yeah. And yet, here you are. Yeah. You, you created your own drink. It's almost, I mean, it's, it's similar to, well, let me ask you how, yeah. would you, how would you compare? Let's back into it. Yeah. Um, um, how, how did you come up with this? Yeah. And why are you doing it? Uh, I came up with this at the end, the last, let's see four months, three or four months of 2018, I had a, in 2018, I took a chunk of time where I was getting very frustrated writing songs. Just, I was back in LA, going back into just songwriting sessions and doing this whole thing. I was taking a break from One Republic. And frankly, I was not like, I was not loving where I was at. I was just not, I wasn't enjoying it the way I wanted to. I didn't like 
I was like, man, I've been... Uh, Were you phoning it in? Like, I don't No, I or? definitely wasn't phoning it in. But I was at a point where I was like, I was going, I have been writing songs since I'm 23. Or, I know, since I was 15. But professionally since age 22, 23. And here I am back in LA in my 30s. I spent eight years in Colorado during like kind of the, the One Republic uh, time period. And I moved back to LA in the city where you can do anything. Film, TV, uh, you know, start a company. It's tech, just anything. Tech, anything you want to do, LA is the land of unlimited opportunity. And here I am, bouncing from session to session with people that I never met, trying to write hit records that we can pitch to artists that kind of don't want us to pitch them songs. And I, it was a, uh, you know, the return on my time was not impressive and I wasn't enjoying it. I was getting more into commercial real estate and kind of learning about that and scratching that itch. Dabbling. Dabbling because it's, it's uh, extremely left brain and I'm, I'm right and left brain, but most of my life just been using that hemisphere. Yeah. And I like the, in the music industry, two plus two equals banana. It doesn't equal, there's, it, it never adds up, right? It's complete craziness, wild west at all times. In commercial real estate, two plus two equals four. And that, that's the one part of, of my you know, life where, uh, it's the one part of my life where uh, the numbers do add up and they get better and better and better. And, and when you're making all your money mm -hmm. by creating, conjuring things out of thin air yeah. that may have unlimited value, tens of millions of dollars of value or zero at all times, yes. it's unsettling, right? And so I was, I was spending more time in, in commercial real estate. I, I was getting disenchanted with songwriting. With, ironically, this is right before I ended up jumping back in full tilt with One Republic, Jonas Brothers, and, and Five Seconds of Summer, and all these different artists. Uh, but I had this super rare quiet time. I had probably 90 days where I didn't, I was intentionally not booking sessions. And I still had this dying urge to create because the, 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 what I do every day is create something from nothing. And that doesn't go away even if I'm not writing songs. I, I feel a need to create. Yeah. So, I relate with that too, by the way. Okay, yeah, so we're on the same page. So I'll, I'm gonna make this as truncated as, as I can and still make sense. I went to high school with Joel and Jesse Stanley of the Stanley Brothers. They started Charlotte's Web. The CBD guys. CBD Kings, the market cap leader. Uh, you know, they went from selling medicinal marijuana to a billion dollar company. Like, it's crazy. So during this time period, I get reacquainted with them. I ended up investing in them pre-IPO. I do a lot of seed investing in different companies as well. And I wanted to understand as much as I could about hemp and CBD. I don't smoke weed, was never for me. The, the one time I did, I had like the worst experience of my life, literally of my life. I don't like not being in control. Um, and so I was like, like everybody else, conservative from Oklahoma, Christian upbringing, Ooh, CBD, is that weed? Is that, is that drugs? Like, what is that? And much to my uh, surprise and uh, elation, I discovered that it is medicine and that it has been used as medicine for, for I don't know, at this point, probably a thousand years, 1500 years, something like that. Right. Um, I, I, anytime I invest in a company, I need to understand what it is before I'm going to write a check. I want to fully understand as much of, of it as I can, the operators, who's running it, what the projections are, all these things. So I did this deep dive into CBD. I started listening to podcasts. I discovered uh, Jeff Chin, the, the head of the UCLA Cannabis Research Institute, through a Jonathan Van Ness podcast. Hmm. Um, and then I found all these articles on CBD and cannabidiol, discovered that humans we all are born with an endocannabinoid system that uh, see, when you introduce, kind of like when you introduce vitamin C to an immune system, what does it do? It, you, it functions better. Introduce uh, pure oxygen to a respiratory system, what does it do? It functions better. Echinacea, so on and so forth. And when I discovered that introducing uh, CBD to your endocannabinoid system allowed you to function better, less anxiety, uh, anti-inflammation, all these, and then a myriad of other health benefits that people can Google at home. Because I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and um, pretend that I'm a doctor. I'm not, but I'm very educated in well, it. It's still evolving. Too. It's evolving. We're, yes, we're still discovering. New we're scratching things. the surface. Yeah. So at this time, I'm, I'm invested in Charlotte's Web, and they're discussing with me the possibility of developing a beverage uh, within Charlotte's Web. So we we kick the can down the road a little bit there. I'm 
uh, tasting other beverages in the space, uh, Vibes, which I'm a big fan of, Jonathan Epper's company, was the first in the space. It was a CBD tea that my, one of my songwriters was drinking every single day and it was actually, actually leveling him out. And he's an anxious dude. Sure. And, and it was actually working. I started drinking it and was like, oh my God, this is, this like calm cooling effect it's having on me is incredible. Like I'm more focused. Yeah. It's, it's counterbalancing all the coffee that I drink and yeah, I love you, coffee. You don't need your Diet Coke. Don't anymore. need my Diet Coke. I don't need sugar. I don't need any of that. So all this is happening and I'm also, I'm also at this point I've been talking to a friend of mine in Inter Interscope saying, you know what? We should do something. I'm signed to Interscope Records, Universal Music. We should create something that's artist friendly that we can start populating in our own network, our own, our own ecosystem, which is beyond vast and cool. You have everybody from Billie Eilish signed Interscope to U2 to No Doubt and everybody in between. Yeah, you already have the network. Exactly, we have the network. And all my friends and the artists that I write, they'd come into my studio and drink whatever's in the fridge. Yeah. And, and Red Bull is probably not a good option. Nobody's touching that stuff. And I, I, I like the Red Bull camp, I like those people, but like not, not my circle. Red Bull's a late night DJ, kind of like, I'll still crush a Red Bull if it's like one in the morning and I'm trying to stay awake, but yeah. not in the middle of the day. Yeah. Um, and so, long story short, I, I start thinking of an, uh, all these things, I, I try to pay attention to just life, the, the signs that life gives you. All these things were happening at the exact same time. I'm having conversations with Charlotte's Web and we're talking about doing a beverage. I, I'm personally drinking CBD. I started buying the, the tinctures to do the 50 milligram doses, but I, I hated how it tasted. Hemp has a very bitter taste. It has a lot of terpenes. It's dark. People mix it with olive oil. And yet you, st you, you take the dose and you're like, oh, this is just, I know this is good for me, yeah. but it tastes like actual medicine. Like medicine, yeah. It's not, it doesn't taste good. It's like chewing up an Advil. Yeah. I at the same time was going through the deck of a company called Source out of Seattle, run by a former VP of Disney, who uh, had aligned himself with the head of product innovation and formulation from Starbucks, Michelle Sunquist. So she's basically in the top three formulas, beverage formulators in the world. Well, here, here we go, it's this pattern yeah, again. The coalescence of yeah. collaboration yes. with experts who know e what they're doing. Exactly. Yeah, I get it. Exactly. I see where you're going. Yeah, the convergence of serendipity, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm considering investing in this company source. Like probably look at 30 or 40 companies a year and invest in maybe six or seven. And I'm meeting, he's, I'm gonna be in LA tomorrow. I'm gonna come down and give you some samples. What we do is we take CBD or any hemp product and we nano emulsify it and we, we basically wrap it. It's like they almost, it's hard to explain, but it's like wrapped in their formula so you can't taste it. He's like, I could, I could put 500 milligrams of CBD in, in, a, in a shot glass in clear water and you can drink it and you won't taste it's it. It's like the candy coating over at the Advil. It's the, it's the candy coating on the Advil. We yeah. are the candy coating. So he comes down and he says, what do you want to do? I said, I have this idea to do a beverage. It's, uh, it's called... Originally, it was called Reverb, and we own the name for that as well, which makes sense. Music, Reverb, yeah. Um, but it's, I said, the, the name that we're developing right now, uh, the company is called Mad Tasty. I named it kind of as a joke. I like things that don't take themselves too seriously, that kind of make you smile. That's my sense of humor. Um, like Silicon Valley style, style sense of humor, right? Or Judd Apatow. So like, Mad Tasty, I figured, well, if you're gonna call a drink Mad Tasty, it has to taste good. I wanted it to have, between 15 and 25 milligrams of CBD. That's after doing a lot of research on the appropriate level of dosing per can. The idea is that if you were to drink four or five cans in a day, you get 80 to 100 milligrams. That's the equivalent of anyone that doses CBD throughout a day is about 100 milligrams. So it's the, yeah. it, it equals out. And I consulted doctors, actual MDs and PhDs uh, for that number. We wanted it to be broad spectrum. So we, we're not using isolate because that's obviously, a, you know, falls more into the uh, pharmaceutical category. Yeah. And we wanted all the health benefits of the, of the plant itself. So you get terpenes, you get all the other minerals and vitamins that come from the plant because it's a green plant Yeah. Uh, in addition to, to CBD. The, the branding, you know, this show is called Behind the Brand. Yeah. The branding of it is yeah. so interesting to me. Uh, you can tell me if this was yeah. deliberate or not, but it kind of sounds like it was. Here you have all these other competitors or substitutes in the yep. space, I can think of, you know, like LaCroix and like yep. Perrier. Of course. Because it's water. Yeah. Um, but it happens to have your special ingredients. Yes. But like, those are sort of like traditional or, 
you know, Perrier right. sounds a little bit more. This is like, a functional, sof sophisticated. Yeah. But even the packaging, yeah. the name, it's kind of like, I don't want to use the word whimsical. It's like it's fun. It's organic. It's, like it's creative. Art. Yeah. It looks like art. Yeah. Um, yeah. There, there was the thought process behind that was, um, look, I work with. I'm not 25, but I work with like every day. The people that I work with are between the ages of like 18 and 30. Yeah. And I'm in that space in the creative field, in music, in art. I'm massively, as you can tell by my studio, I'm into street art, and all kinds of art. And um, I wanted a can. I was looking at Lacroix and other beverages, and and you see three or four of them scattered on a on a on a desktop or an office table. You want to scrape them into the trash. They they're not, from my opinion, appealing to look at. A lot of a lot of the packaging from a lot of brands. Well, I would say, in my opinion, yeah, you know, uh, that they sort of fade into the background. They fade into the background. They're not distinctive. Exactly. They're not special. Exactly. You know, it, it could just as easily be a Sprite can or, or who knows what kind yep. of. It's a can. Yeah, it's a can. It's yeah. a can. There's some companies, obviously, Coca-Cola nailed it, right? That's a s iconic. Like, yeah. That's a piece of art. I wanted something that looked like a piece of street art. Yeah. Um, I wanted it. I wanted the brand itself, the can itself, if it's going to sit empty or full on somebody's table or desk to be so attractive aesthetically that you would actually, even when it's empty, you just kind of leave it because it looks like a piece of art. That's where we arrived at, obviously, the kind of street art vibe. This looks like graffiti art from New York from like the 1980s. And yeah. That was the idea. Yeah. I wanted it to taste better than all the brands that you just mentioned. So I sat down with Michelle, uh, the formulist at Source, and, and she invented the, she was one of the small team of people that invented the pumpkin spice latte and nitro cold brew and a bunch of others. She's, she's a badass. I said, so what do you wanna do? I said, you know the brands that are out there, the sparkling water brands, I'm not gonna name them on the show. She says, yeah, I said, it has to taste better than all of them, period. And I, I said, I got time. <laughs> it has to taste better than all of them. Yeah. In a blind taste test, it has to. So she arrived at that destination quicker than I thought. And the first two flavors were grapefruit and watermelon kiwi. Why? Because those are two flavors I like to drink. Yeah. Um, we have a third one coming out uh, very soon that's I think it's going to be the unicorn of the bunch. Um, and I never plan on starting a beverage company at all, zero. I, I ne it never occurred to me. It, it happened because I saw the lack of something that I wanted in the marketplace. I wanted a cold, sparkling beverage that wasn't, uh, I, I love vibes, but I didn't want fruit juice and I didn't want to have more calories. I wanted it to be a negligible amount of calories. Yeah. And what I told Source was, I want the, the the actual physical act of drinking the can, by the time you finished it, you've burned more calories drinking it than is in the can. That was the number. Yeah, and here, here you are, active musician on stage. Yes. You gotta hydrate. <clears throat> of course. I mean, water's important. Yeah, and I don't drink enough water. And the, the, the truth of the matter is, I love coffee, and I'll, coffee will last me three hours, a nice coffee. Yeah. I end up not drinking near enough water throughout the day, so I thought, I get it, I'm gonna check three boxes at once. I, I love how CBD makes me feel. I don't like the taste of it, check. This tastes phenomenal. You taste no hemp at all. Two, I want to drink way more water than I am. I drink four of these a day. Yeah. So no sugar. That's no sugar at all. I want, yeah, that's 48 ounces of water. Between that and what I have in the morning, I, I'm hitting 60 ounces of water a day. Um, there's, I want zero sugar. I guess that's more than th three points. The, zero sugar, we have zero sugar, all natural. I wanted a clean label. And then the fourth, and for me, the most important aspect of the brand because I wasn't sitting around as some latent um, like beverage maverick who was just dying to create the, I needed to, to do this. I wanted to do this. It was an expression of art for me. Yeah. Put my, I put my foot down and, and told everybody that's involved, I said, I will not do this company if we do not do a one for one. If we are not giving away as much water as we are selling, this is not worth it for me. That's a, a deal killer. That's the whole cause aspect. That's the cause aspect. Yeah. Um, and we partnered with Drop for Drop, and uh, for every 12 ounce can sold, it's the Tom's Shoes uh, yeah. idea. And I'm a, inspired by Tom's Shoes and Blake Mykoski, and, yeah. and he's now, uh, we're talking with him, let's just say that. Blake's been on the show, he's Okay. Great. Yeah, yeah, so we just, we got connected last week out of the blue uh, on, on email, and um, I think we, we're, potentially gonna do some stuff together, which would be cool. And um, More collaboration. There you go, more that. collaboration. And I love his sister's brand too, Aviator Nation, phenomenal brand. Uh, I wanted, I watched the documentary recently, um, Inside the Mind of Bill Gates on Netflix. And the whole well. first hour is dedicated to water. Yeah. And that struck a chord with me. That's as we were developing this. I thought, man, this is absolutely insane. 
there needs to be clean water wells everywhere. So Drop for Drop, my friend runs that uh, charity, Simon Konecki, uh, who happens to be Adele's ex-husband. Thus, I met him through Adele. Mm -hmm. the, the whole world is a small world. Yeah. And he, his life's mission is water, is clean water. So we partnered with Simon and with Drop for Drop. And for every can sold, we, we, yeah, we, we donate the equivalent of 12 ounces of clean drinking water. What that equates to is we build wells. So after X amount of cans sold, and I hope to lower that amount as we scale to where it's like we're, I, when we have our weekly meetings with the Mad Tasty team, First Bev was our first major investor, um, who, you know, they, they've done uh, Health Aid Kombucha and, and uh, Essentia, and are one of the main people at First Bev that advises me every day. Jack Belsito was the CEO of Voss and the CEO of Snapple. Yeah. I mean, we have some real players here. Yeah, can I just say though, I'm just so amazed at how hands-on you seem to be in all of this. Yeah. Like, you're not doing it alone, we get that. No. Uh, you've got well-qualified experts yeah. um, driving the train. But yet, here you are, very hands-on, you know, with certain non-negotiables, whether it's yeah. packaging or taste or cause. Mm -hmm. uh, that's incredible. Well, I, I don't, I, I, I'm obsessive and uh, which is a good thing and a bad thing. And the, the bad thing is that it's hard to turn off. But the good thing is that um, for me, the devil's in the details and that is, where, that is where great ideas go to die, is in missed details. That is where opportunities are missed. Um, that's when people get inadvertently offended without cause. Uh, it, all these different things like breakdown of communication, um, the details matter. I, I talk with our sales team almost every day. I have at least one call or text exchange. Um, and we are, we are constantly figuring out ways to improve and whatever product you start with isn't the product you finish with. I know the other competitors in the landscape. I think the, there's room for a handful of us. Uh, my objective was to be the best, the leader in the field, period. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that. <laughs> You know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going. But like I say, man, always said it. It's not about the destination. It's all about the journey. Ain't nothing changed but the weather. The dangling carrot that hang from the rear view uh -huh. Your dreams in the past ain't nowhere near you uh -huh. Backseat drivers got nothing but two cents Shotgun riders too biased, they all liars I should get an A for effort, I'm too tired But I'm never giving up, that's why I'm kinda admired Role model, like it or not, I gotta play it Sugarcoat the rhyme sometimes, but still say it Said I was quitting at 40, it's just a fib I'm still a kid that's wiping the food off of my bib You ever wanted something so bad that you could taste it? Cried over everything Every opportunity wasted, yeah. good and bad news, which one you want first, either way you feel